It's Sunday night, and that means it's time to head in our time machine back to WrestleMania 18, The Rock vs. Hulk Hogan. We're going to talk about that and much more right after this. All right, so we're going to get right back to the WWE podcast in a second, but I just want to talk quickly about a product I recently came across, and it's called Mirex, M-I-R-R-E-X. So for you guys out there, you may want to direct your uh, your female counterpart to this website. It's, it's pretty cool. It's a makeup mirror, but it's much more than that. The company is based in Colorado, and just so you guys know, Mirex stands for the Innovative Mirror. They're here to improve the lifestyle of individuals, and they want to take a step into the future, and that they have. They have taken the makeup mirror and turned it into a smart makeup mirror. So what's this going to do? It's going to change the way that mirrors are used. There are three levels of LED light for those last-minute face checks, and you can even charge your phone wirelessly. It also has an attachment to take that really cool, well-lighted selfie. So you, you guys really got to check this out. This is really, I've never seen anything like this. Uh, it's mirex.store, M-I-R-R-E-X dot store. That's M-I-R-R-E-X dot store. This is definitely one of the coolest things that I've seen, and it would make a great gift. So check out mirex.store today. Welcome to the WWE Podcast. Your place for the most passionate wrestling analysis on the web. Just turn Roman heel. What is WWE waiting for? When other wrestling podcasts put you to sleep, you can count on the WWE Podcast to keep you engaged and asking for more. I've been watching wrestling for over 20 years, and that was one of the best matches I've ever seen. This is unlike any other wrestling analysis. So without any further delay, let's get the show started right now. Welcome to the WWE Podcast. It is Sunday, September 29th, 2019. Thank you so much for joining me, and we're going to get to the Hogan Rock match that happened in Toronto that changed a lot of different things in WWE and was one of the more, I think, overachieving matches in WWE at the time. And uh, I think we all thought that it was going to be Austin Hogan, and should have that match should that match have happened? Yes. Uh, and Stone Cold has said that hey, he wasn't in a good headspace at that time, and um, you know, look. It should have been Austin Hogan. There's no question about it. Austin Hogan is just the right thing to do. Austin has always been a bigger star than The Rock. And as massive as The Rock has been and successful as The Rock has been, he was never quite Stone Cold Steve Austin. So it should have been Austin Hogan, but we got Rock Hogan. And in a match that I think and many probably would uh, believe this as well, that it, had over it overachieved. It was a match that was very... Um, it could have gone very badly in terms of quality of of uh, of the match and the build to it and and everything else that went with it. So, in the grand scheme of things, while the crowd didn't react to the way WWE cast the good and bad guy, they went along with it. the the um, The announcers went along with it, and it's amazing when you just go with what the audience is telling you. The success you can have, yeah. Hint, hint, Roman Reigns. But we're going to get to that match in just a moment. But first, thank you guys. I, I know I do this all the time, and I thank you guys for listening, but I really mean that because this show would not be a success or where it's at without you. Uh, this is a, a show that is growing. I don't really see any stop here. Um, it's starting to really gain traction, and it's because of you guys that it is doing so. And uh, look, there's tons of selections out there thousands of podcasts out there we are actually ranked currently again this fluctuates from hour to hour but we are number 21 on the uh apple podcast wrestling category so we are number 21 out of i don't know how many wrestling podcasts again not the sports category in general the sports category is just decimated by big names and uh long-standing podcasts that are very difficult to edge out. So, um, but in the wrestling category, this podcast is ranked 21 as we speak right now. And hey, that could drop by the time you're done listening to this. It just fluctuates all the time or it could go up. Who knows? But I just want to let you guys know that that success is because of you. You know, the, the, this, this show's success is not based on me sitting here rambling to you or, or you know, ranting at times. And it's about you guys listening. And, and I do appreciate it because, like I said, this this is a this is a deal that is easy to get into, and there's so many about them out there. But um, I know that your time is valued, and I I do appreciate you listening to the show. It's uh, 
it's a cool deal. It's a cool deal, and I continue. I expect to continue to do this for as long as I can see. I mean, I don't. I don't see any end in sight for this. In fact, we're bringing on new team, a new team member this week, um, and we will be bringing them into the NXT fold and getting weekly shows done on NXT. As it is a huge wrestling week, huge wrestling week with AEW and Dynamite kicking off for the first time, going head to head. This is this is the week that we had circled on the calendar a year and a half ago. With WWE, well, I shouldn't say a year and a half ago. This is the this is the week in which I would say a year ago we circled on the calendar to say, "Hey, Fox is coming up." AEW at the time didn't announce when they were doing their weekly show, but we knew that they were up and coming, and we knew that eventually we would get an, a uh, a weekly televised program, and now we're getting it. Uh, we've been looking ahead to this week for months. And I know that it's something that wrestling podcasts like myself are struggling to figure out how the hell to cover (laughs) because there's so much content. And luckily, I have some pretty cool uh, hosts that are going to be taking care of that. And I don't have to be, you know, pulling the pulling the uh, wagon by myself. And I'm very thankful for those individuals. Um, And just so you know, I'll be bringing on the AEW host for this show on Tuesday. Well, we'll discuss Monday Night Raw, of course, but also give you guys another listen to him and and reintroduce him to you so that you can get a feel for what his shows are going to be like starting this week. It's a huge week for content. Um, Like I said a couple of weeks ago, this is a show that's going to be done six times a week regularly, four days a week with myself and or co-host, and then Two solo shows that have nothing to do with me. So if you hate my voice or think I ran too much or think whatever of me, you have two days a week that I don't have to be there. (laughs) And you can listen to someone else discuss uh, wrestling and AEW and NXT. So that's a good thing. I'm I'm very excited to be bringing on these people. And and I think you guys will enjoy them. And I I really do anticipate this show to grow by leaps and bounds even more than we are now. So uh, And by the way, guys... Many people have asked, hey, you know, it's been this one of the number one complaints on any podcast, not just me, not just me. I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not firing back at anybody like ads are a pain in the neck, right? Well, easy way to solve that is head on over to patreon.com, patreon.com slash WWE podcast will get you an ad free experience of the entire WWE podcast library for a dollar. One measly dollar will get you access to the entire library ad free a shout out on this show and get you access to the video library that i'm now starting and started last week and will continue to do so as we ramp up into an extremely important busy busy week with wrestling so you're not going to want to miss that the videos are exclusive to patreon you will not see any of the videos on any other feed, Apple, Google, Spotify, TuneIn, uh, iHeartRadio, Spreaker, none of that will be included or uh, will include the video feed. So just an FYI, also a little bit of an enticement, right, to check out the Patreon feed. Who the hell wouldn't want to monetize their podcast? Let's just put it out there straight, right? Anybody that says that they don't want to is just lying, it's flat out, right? But I do love doing this. It just makes sense for me to maximize my minutes, as Jim Ross would tell you. So check that out at patreon.com slash WWE podcast or head on over to the website. I always tell you guys that I do have a website. It's I invested a lot of time and uh, resources, let me just put it that way, into redesigning the site and giving it a completely new, fresh look. So head on over to WWEpodcast.com for all of your latest podcasts and, of course, your um, really easy way to support the show. How do you do that? There's a support the show tab. Click on it. And all you got to do is click on the banner after that. So, um, all right, guys. Well, uh, just to, I want to set the table here for the the Rock and Hogan because the Rock and Hogan, we I, as I opened with it, I think I was a bit disappointed in real time as I was doing this and, and as I was watching it and the Rock Hogan storyline pan out. Now, remember, the NWO were not introduced to WWE until 2002. The so when the whole invasion angle happened, there was a delay in bringing up the big guys. And I think that I can say with fairly high confidence that 
the reason that the invasion angle is looked at as not a total flub, but as I would say under par was because when the invasion angle happened, it was a whole bunch of B players. It wasn't the top guys. You didn't have Sting. You didn't have the NWO, Hogan, Nash, Hall, right? You didn't have Goldberg. You didn't have these guys that had mega big contracts that everybody really wanted to see come in because they had guaranteed money. Why would they come in to work when they had guaranteed money and were still under contract with Time Warner? Doesn't make sense. So that whole delay in the invasion angle happening with the big stars coming in, I think was a uh, a negative it negatively impacted the invasion angle. That honestly, I mean, I know some people hated it and looking back, I you know, I've seen things on WWE Network and you know, I've listened to the top stars, the announcers talk about it. I really didn't dislike it as much as some people did. Could it have been better? Absolutely it could have been better. But with what WWE did with the talent they had, and you again, you had mid-tier to mid-upper tier guys like DDP, RVD, right, coming with the ECW. I mean, it was it did get a little watered down having only WCW referees referee WCW matches, but yet everyone's still employed by WWE. It was bizarre. It was a little bizarre, led by Shane McMahon and Stephanie owning ECW. So, again, the McMahons at the helm is, is really what we're talking about here. So, again, um, but I'm just trying to set the table here for the Hogan-Rock match. And if I recall, the whole setup happened when The Rock and and, uh, and Hogan and, F- and F- Hall and Nash all met backstage, just as they met Stone Cold backstage. I remember they offered Stone Cold a six-pack of beer, and he turned it down. And we had The Rock meet them backstage, too. And um, then it ended up being, you know, Hogan and Nash and Hall beating down The Rock. Austin makes the save. It's one of the best SmackDown pops you'll ever hear is, I mean, just YouTube it. It's Austin comes to save the rock from the NWO, something to that effect. And I mean, think about that. Like, think about how far SmackDown has fallen when it comes to star power. Think about that. You had Hogan, Nash, Hall, Austin, rock on the same program on free television to end SmackDown uh, on the 2002 edition. Just think about that. It's mind-blowing to think of where we are now. And again, that's no diss to where we are now to the guys there. But the fact is, star power will always and forever be what drives eyeballs to the product and ultimately money into your wallet. Always. And when you don't have that star power, ratings suffer. Attendance suffers. Merchandise sales suffer. WWE Network subscriptions suffer. It's always and forever will be about star power in any sport. Major League Baseball. Football. I don't care. It's all about star power. And it should always be the focus of WWE. Unfortunately, I think at times it's not. But at the time, think about those names. It's mind-blowing. So I'm going to give you audio, of course. I'm going to give you guys some audio from the match. And we're going to get to that in a minute. But don't forget, too, the whole setup to this after, um, or I think it was a couple of weeks before WrestleMania, Hogan beat The Rock in a tag team match clean and then proceeded to put him in an ambulance and then hit the ambulance with a semi. Um, So that was pretty damn extreme. And... That added some heat to the to the fire, gasoline to the fire, if you will. And I really enjoyed that part of it. It heated it up for a rivalry that I thought should always have been Austin's. Always. It was just tailor-made for Austin Hogan. Wasn't meant to be. The wrestling god said nope. And it obviously never, ever will happen. It would be a complete disaster if it does. And I've got some Austin news uh, on the back end, as well as some CM Punk news after uh, we discuss Hogan Rock. So you're going to want to stay tuned for that. I've got some pretty cool pretty cool news from both ends, if you haven't already heard, or you may have already. But either way, you're going to get my take on it. So 
All right. Well, before we do anything else, guys, um, and we're going to get to some audio from Hogan and Rock, and I'm getting chills just thinking about it with the Toronto crowd, who really are the stars. One of the three stars of the show was the Toronto crowd that night that um, we all know turned on the Rock. And hearing the announcers call an audible to try to go with what the audience is telling you instead of just saying, oh, we're in Bizarro World, all oh, this WrestleMania crowd, oh, the non-traditional audience, nonsense. It's a bunch of crap when they do that now. And it's amazing when you just roll with the tide how easy things can flow. But it's something that WWE has not, in at least recent history, had a consistent record of following through with. So, All right, well, guys, at the end of a hard week, it's great to sit down, take some time off, and watch some football. There really isn't anything better, right? Sunday comes along where you got to go to work Monday, but football's always there for you, right? They're, they're that, like, best friend that comes with you on Sunday. They're always there. There's just nothing like the NFL, and there's no better way to make the games even more exciting than to bet on them. So how do you do that? You go to mybookie.ag. Easy, right? Mybookie.ag. No one gives you more ways to win than they do. All you have to do is head to mybookie.ag. Just do the smart thing. If you're going to bet on football this season, just bet with mybookie. If you're the kind of guy that likes to bet a little and win a lot, just try a parlay. If all of your picks come through, you'll multiply your winnings, and no matter how you bet, the NFL season is the best time of the year to bet, hands down. Join now, and MyBookie will double your first deposit. Just use promo code WWE to activate the offer. That's promo code WWE to activate that offer of doubling your deposit. Go visit MyBookie.ag today. You play, you win, and you get paid. So let's get to some of that audio from Toronto at WrestleMania 18. Let's listen to what the audience did in Toronto for Hulk Hogan's entrance. And don't forget, you know, Hulk Hogan left WWE. He left WWE in the mid-90s. So it was some time since the fans have seen him. And it was almost as if it was a welcome home. I don't care if you are labeled as the bad guy. It was respect. It was uh, excitement. And having him be there for WrestleMania was a massive moment, regardless of him trying to play the the heel Hollywood Hulk Hogan gimmick. It didn't matter. The fans saw through it, didn't care. It was the fact that, hey, this is Hulk Hogan. We're not we know we're not gonna be fooled by this mirage of him trying to play the heel as Hulk Hollywood Hulk Hogan. Hell, Hollywood Hulk Hogan's a cool dude. When you think about it, he's kind of a cool dude. The black and white were replaced from the red and yellow. And yes, he all, he went back to red and yellow, as we all know, uh, with his subsequent years on SmackDown and his feud with Vince McMahon and Mr. America and that whole nonsensical thing. And he had, he had, no, he had matches with whole, or he had matches with, um, with Shawn Michaels at SummerSlam and the undertaker, which did not go well, but um, this was just a welcome home pop, a r- mad respect pop and that's what this was so let's let's take a listen to that and listen to the best announcer in the world do what he does best jim ross So that was Hogan's entrance, and you can tell right off the bat that that Jim Ross and uh, the King were trying to cover for 
what was the opposite reaction that they had booked. And The Rock was on top for a while. The Rock had been on top for a long time. But in the grand scheme of things, Hulk Hogan's still a bigger name. Hulk Hogan laid the foundation for the success of WWF, especially during the mid-80s. We all know his programs with Macho Man, with Ultimate Warrior, with Andre. You know, but the respect was there. It was the fact of the WWE fans realizing that this is the biggest name in professional wrestling ever. And look, we've we've loved The Rock for a while. He's been our top guy, but he's starting to feel a little stale. And I think at the time he was. I was still a Rock fan. I was just a mark for The Rock from beginning to end. And I didn't understand why people were cheering for Hulk Hogan. I'm like, hey, he's a bad guy. You know, I, I was just, I was being the good little fan. And I was going along with what I was told to cheer for. And I was, I remember sitting there and going, what, 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 what is Toronto doing? What the hell is Toronto doing? And again, in 2002, you have to know my age here. I, I've said this before, I'll say it again. I was born in 1985. So, this match took place in 2002, which means I was a very ripe old age of 17. So, I was 17 years old listening to this going, what in the hell is happening? And the crowd is already all over, um, or all in support of Hulk Hogan. And why don't we, because I think it's only fair... Listen to the reaction that The Rock gets in kind. This man has headlined nine of those events. Whether it's nostalgia, call it what you will, respect. There's a lot of Hollywood Hulk Hogan fans here in Sky Dome tonight. So uh, a very lukewarm reaction for The Rock. It didn't exactly blow the roof off the place, but The Rock certainly got a a warm reaction, just not the mega pop that Hogan did. Um, You didn't hear a whole lot of boos in his entrance, but don't worry, that changes during his match, which of course I'm going to give you guys audio from in just a minute as well. But I'm setting the stage again a little bit. I mean, this was a, a match that I don't think we realized the magnitude of, and yes, we said it was a dream match at the time. But this changed the course of The Rock's career and Hogan's career simply by the crowd reaction in Toronto. Because had the crowd just played nice little fans and done what WWE said that we could do and we were supposed to do, I think The Rock would have continued as a babyface and Hogan would have continued as a heel. Um, But we all know that that changed and The Rock referenced referenced that in multiple promos after that. And, uh, you know, I think that WWE wanted to not just make sure that this was in a, ah, it's a WrestleMania crowd. We can't base the entire storyline or changing the rocks creative direction based on one audience reaction. However, however, um, and they didn't change it the next night, but what they did do was really take a larger sample size of the rocks promos and how the audience is reacting to him. And I remember him doing a promo. I think it was a WWE WWF New York and he was coming in to insult Stephanie or something like that, and he actually ended up getting booed. And it was because he was on his way to Hollywood, and the audience was just rejecting him like crazy because, hey, you're the guy who's leaving us. You're the guy who is um, is, is leaving us high and dry for Hollywood. And uh, so the fans felt abandoned, and they were feeling a little, feel a little bit stale about The Rock after so many years of him on top, and he did an amazing job. I mean, I don't even just... That's not even the right words to use for how successful The Rock was as the top babyface in WWE. But Hulk Hogan was a bigger name. He had 
been away from WWE for many years. It was a welcome home. Yeah, Jim Ross can say it's nostalgia. Part of it was that. But it was also that WWE has not, the fans have not seen Hulk Hogan in many years. Uh, Many of them since their childhood. And it was just a really cool deal to have him come back at WrestleMania in Toronto, which again, it's Bizarro World. So you got to add that to uh, the whole reaction that The Rock got. But it was 80,000 people strong in the uh, Toronto Sky Dome. And it just got more and more brutal for The Rock as the match went on. So let's take a listen to some of the audio. And we had that just iconic stare down. And I don't know if I'm really a fan of that where they they stand there and, uh, you know, they look left and they look right very dramatically. And they soak in the moment and the fans go nuts. It worked here, but I've seen it done before where it doesn't work and it feels forced. These moments can't be produced, so I would think that this happened in the the um, spur of the moment. But, I mean, I can't confirm it. If it wasn't, it still felt right, and I, I was all for it. So let's take a little bit of a listen here to some of the audio during the match and how the crowd was reacting to The Rock and Hogan. So there's just a little bit of a sample. I mean, you guys know how the match went. And, um, you know, the crowd was, it sounded 80-20, 90-10 in support of the Hulkster. And every move, they were, the the crowd was invested. You talk about emotional investment. There's no better match to point to than Hogan and Rock. That is an emotional investment where every move matters. Every counter matters. Everything matters that's done in the ring. That is called emotional investment and something you very rarely see today. It, it was just it engaged the crowd from the very beginning. The stare down, the entrances to every move, every punch, every hold, all the way through to the finish, uh, of which I'll play in just a minute. But it, it really encapsulated the crowd. And um, they tried to, WWE tried to position this as a passing of the torch match. I don't know if it really was. I mean, The Rock was about to hit Hollywood. So he's not necessarily the future, as WWE called him at the beginning of the match here, and what Jim Ross labeled him as the future of WWE, when really he was kind of one foot in WWE, one foot outside, trying to dip his toe into Hollywood at the time. So is he really the future of WWE? The young lion and the old lion, they tried to tell that age-old tale. I understand the psychology, I know the analogy, But that really wasn't the accurate way to describe it. I mean, you're making this larger than life, but really, The Rock is already a guy that is the top guy. It's it's not a passing of the torch when you have Hulk Hogan, who is in another company for years and years and years, dominate that company, yet The Rock is in WWE, WWF, dominating that company, and he was the top guy. He's not a young, up-and-coming blue chipper anymore, okay? He was the guy in WWE. And to say it's a passing of the torch, I I don't know. I guess that's just my 34-year-old mind going back and trying to analyze how they were portraying the match to the fans at home. And um, I don't have a problem with it. Again, let, let me just be clear. I don't have a problem with that. Okay, I'm just being, I guess, a little bit analytical, over-analytical of that, as I tend to be. Um, but overall, I think, I think the match was better than it probably should have been. Given Hulk Hogan's limitations at that time with knee problems, and I mean, he had injuries, he had injuries upon injuries, and The Rock and and Hogan's style meshed very well, and there was fear at that time. Not only was Stone Cold not in his quote good headspace, but also that 
Hogan and Austin's matching uh, chemistry and style in, in ring would not match up well with a brawler versus a very slow, methodical type of um, opponent. And maybe it wouldn't have. Maybe Austin Hogan would have been a flop, and we'd look back and go, eh, that was okay. I mean, you, we might have said that Austin Hogan, the hype was better than the actual event. Maybe we would have said that. In this case, I think that the match over-delivered on the hype, which is something that is, uh, to me, a better outcome. So uh, just some food for thought there. But let's get to the finish of Rock and Hogan. So that's the finish of the match, obviously. Lots more there. I didn't want to string you guys out too much with the commentary of Jim Ross and, and uh, the King, but it pretty much spelled it out pretty in very simple terms that they noticed this fan support for Hogan. They didn't just brush it off like Corey Graves and Michael Cole are scheduled or, or instructed to do that whenever a babyface does not get the reaction that he or she should and vice versa. Well, the, the, audience, the crowd is loud tonight or... Uh, they're certainly voicing their opinion, or they don't even say that. They might even just completely ignore it and just do business as usual. They have WWE has certainly had a change in philosophy of when the audience does not jive with what they have positioned their talent to be. It's a change in philosophy, as simple as that. We're not well. We're not going to knee jerk reaction to every audience that you know has a, a negative reaction for I don't know whoever, Finn Balor or whatever. And I understand you don't want a knee jerk for everything, but when you see a trend and it's not just people bucking the system or trying to be cool or trying to be defiant because that's our generation. Apparently, that's what is believed that our generation is defiant in at wrestling events that we just boo people because it's cool. Nope. We pay our hard earned money to not just have, quote, fun and be defiant. We pay our hard earned money because, well, most likely we are actually wrestling fans and we care about characters that we're trying to be invested in. And when you cast them incorrectly, we are going to tell you and not just do it out of fun. And we don't really mean it. It's not a wink and a nod and a ha ha. We're just doing this to be fun and funny. That's, that's, I don't know where WWE comes up with this, this really warped mindset and ideology that fans just do this because it's cool. No. Fans react loudly when they feel a true emotional connection. That's real. So this th- that whole argument is just as flat as water. So, but nonetheless, a match that over delivered, a match that will always live in the in the uh, WrestleMania history as one of the best ever because of not necessarily it's not a five star match. We don't see people you know doing crazy things, but we don't need that. When you tell a good story, you don't need to cover it with four sixty splashes and cover it with. Just, you know, 300 suicide dives. If you have a good story, the story tells itself. You don't need to kill your body to do it with and cover with it for, for bad storytelling. Think about that for 2019 when it comes to this this version of and redef, uh, redefining of what a five-star match is in 2019. Much different than it was. Why? Because the star power isn't as high. So you have to... 
at least this is the belief, that you have to kill your body and or do things that are unnecessary in the ring at the sacrifice of actual selling, which is ironically what's going to get people emotionally invested, is selling because of the fact that we don't have the star power that would cover you and make people intrinsically be emotionally invested rather than just having to cover yourself for just doing 400 crazy moves to get people interested. That's not true emotional investment anyway. That's a very superficial reason to get people invested is just to see, you know, basically you're, you're, you know, you're, you're Cirque du Soleil. What's next, right? What's next? Oh, cool. What's next? What's oh, cool. What's next? Instead of getting emotionally invested in the characters, they're caring about what moves are next. Bad. That's bad. And I'm, that's what's fearful for me of 2019 in wrestling across the board. Across the board. That is what's fearful for me as a wrestling fan in 2019. I'm talking NXT, SmackDown, Raw, AEW to some extent. Is What is defined as a five-star wrestling match now is not true emotional connection, not true emotional investment. It's extremely superficial with the moves and caring about, oh, well, they're, they're cool, but let's see what they can do in the ring. And let's see what kind of cool reversal, reversals they can do and how many kickouts of finishers they can do. It's so surface level that it doesn't grab me by the heartstrings anymore. It doesn't make me care about the characters they're presenting because of the fact that, and look, this just is what it is in 2019. It has been redefined of what's a great match. This is awesome chance are only done for matches that are, quote, physically entertaining. Physically entertaining, and absolutely that's a part of what makes a match great, is inside the ring for the physicality part of it. But you can tell a great story without having a, quote, this is awesome type of match that we have defined as awesome in 2019. It's just the evolution of the business, and I get it. But think about back in the day. We didn't have all this crazy... No, this crazy no selling, which is a huge, huge problem for wrestling, is the lack of selling because it's all about the moves now. And when you take the physicality of what could actually happen if you did those moves out of the equation, you take the selling out. You're taking the selling completely out because it's always about what's next, what's next, what's next, what's next, what's next. And, and it's a very short attention span type of wrestling that we have in 2019. And it's it's... It's not good for the long-term health of the business because it's so quick hitting and oh, gotta have it now. It's like, it's like watching fireworks, right? I think this is a perfect analogy. It's like watching fireworks because you're not interested necessarily in the firework that's happening at the moment. You're thinking, what's next? What's next? What's next? And you're bang, 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 bang. What's next? What's next? It's like fireworks going off rather than having a fire burning. Fire that's burning lasts longer. And you're able to absorb what you're looking at at a much deeper level. I don't know if that's the best analogy, but it's one. So, all right. Well, I think I made my point. But um, some news coming through the wire, guys. CM Punk to WWE? Is this, could this be true? Well, in the latest report here as I'm scrolling through the news feed, unless you probably have already seen it because news spreads like wildfire in 2019. So here, here's... Um, Here's the news coming out here. The news of CM Punk trying out for a position at the upcoming WWE Backstage Series on Fox was the biggest news here. Dave Meltzer provided an update on the situation in the latest episode of Wrestling Observer Radio, and he revealed that the feeling is that Punk's tryout went really well. Um, So we noted before how Fox was tested out in different versions of the show, and according to Meltzer, the former world champion will probably get an offer to join the series. Again, this is a offer to join the series, the WWE Backstage Series on Fox. This does not necessarily mean that you will hear CM Punk's music hit, the crowd will lose their minds, and you will have a CM Punk match. That does not mean it. However, that being said, that's still this still is huge news because it opens up the possibility and, and, and opens up the gates for a CM Punk return again. This is baby step one, but it's a huge one. It's a huge one. Do I eventually think we'll see CM Punk back in WWE? I do. I actually thought AEW would be the one to nab them. I think he would have been a better fit in AEW. They would have been, I think, a 
much more uh, newsworthy organization if they had gotten CM Punk. But he wasn't a make it or break it. He wasn't a guy that's the future. He's, you know, but it would have certainly created a crazy buzz around AEW. However, it has um, been pretty well publicized now that AEW was not where CM Punk wanted to go because the fact that AEW text CM Punk an offer, CM Punk has made public and did not like the style in which that they had offered him whatever they were going to offer him for an appearance, a one-year contract. I don't know. But he didn't like the way that it was done and really trashed AEW publicly, which was not a smart move if you were trying to get with AEW. Clearly, CM Punk's not, right? I think that that WWE, if he's going to make any kind of return, is where Punk is looking. Um, So another little note, and again, this is something that I touched on a little bit, I think, in my podcast last time, is that Austin has left the door open for for a, a potential match. How did he do that? Well... He discussed on his show last week that physically he could go. He said that he could physically go in theory. Now, does that mean that we're going to hear the glass break Monday night and we're going to see Austin get in a long-term program with somebody? No, it doesn't. I still don't believe Austin will have another match. I really don't think he will for a couple of reasons. One, Austin is super, super critical of himself. He left at an extremely high watermark of facing The Rock at WrestleMania 19. Was it as good as the WrestleMania 17 encounter? No, I don't think so. But that is, that's no slight to that match. He went out on top with his best opponent ever on the biggest stage ever. So for him to return, we wouldn't want it to be a Shawn Michaels-esque return where he returns clearly for the money, of which WWE is producing Crown Jewel again. I'll get to that in a minute. But this is something that Austin is super critical of himself at and also add to the fact that Austin has said on multiple occasions through the years, I could get myself in ring shape. And he has healed from all of his injuries, from his spinal stenosis, getting a bone spur removed from his spine, all that. So his his physical body is fine. But to go through the mental part of this, to get himself ready, which would probably take four to six months to get in ring shape, different than gym shape, ring shape, get your lungs up, you know, get the cardio, shred some weight to get himself to that point. He could do it, but he said, jack yourself up. He said it took him how many years to get the the business out of his blood, out of his brain, out of his body and to bring it back in and go full bore because that's what he would do. He would not half-ass this at all or phone anything in. You would have to reignite that flame, which it could easily be lit again and then do what? One match and then what? Then what? Right? He'd have to go through this whole process again of basically withdrawal from wrestling. And I understand that. He gets away from it. He was able to finally weed himself of wrestling in his blood, at least of craving, I gotta have it, gotta do it, gotta need it. And to go back, do all that work for one match, and then what? Right? I think that's a very good point brought up by Austin, but... Do I enjoy him coming to the show and doing some stunners and drinking some beer and laying people out? Oh, hell yeah. Of course I do. Love it. Would I I watch if he got in a program that led to an actual match? Absolutely. Let me just put it that way. I just don't know if I would want to see it if Austin truly doesn't want it and if it may not be the Austin that we remember from yesteryear. And he knows that. Smart guy. So it just left the door open a little bit. And it was a change in narrative from his constant um, uh, constant saying, I don't know, man, that's kind of behind me. Uh, I've got several projects. I've got other stuff I'm doing. It was a much different answer than what we have gotten over the last, my God, 16 years. My God, it's been that long. 16 years since Austin had a, a match. More than that because it was in uh, March of 2003. We're now in September of 2019, and we're still talking about this. It's, it's just nuts. Uh, so one last thing. Uh, WWE is, has announced that they will be producing a Crown Jewel event in Saudi Arabia in October. Good Lord. Um, so I'm, I'm split on this. Many people have protested and said, F this. I'm not watching the show. It's basically blood money uh, and that there's just too much bad press. Why is WWE doing this? There's, you know... They're just basically stupid, for lack of a better term, because it's late and I'm tired. 
But that is the essence of what a lot of fans are saying, that they are, ba- they are protesting this show, will not watch, and is giving them a bad tone and feeling from WWE. While I understand that, and the, the circumstances surrounding last year's Crown Jewel, horrific, and damning, and uneasy, and wrong, all of them, all of those adjectives, I believe are correct. Just it was a ba- and and on top of that, it was a bad event. Bad. You had Shawn Michaels returning, yikes, with a bald head, and he did not look great, yikes. It it, it just left a bad taste in everybody's mouth. With the events surrounding it, people wondering if it's going to be canceled, and they didn't. And they had Shawn Michaels return for money to go to Saudi Arabia. It was a bald head and not perform well. And then you come out of retirement for what? It just wasn't great. So you add all that up and you carry that black cloud of what Saudi Arabia is and the black cloud of what Crown Jewel was last year. And you bring it into 2019. It certainly doesn't have a good feeling to it. You name it the same event, and maybe that's in the contract that it has to be named that event. So I'll chalk it up to the fact that it has to be a part of the contract that was written in this mega million dollar contract with Saudi Saudi Arabia. So that's fine if that's part of it, but if they, at their discretion, decided to name this Crown Jewel Part 2, that's just plain stupid. However, just because of the connotation and things that are carried with it, People have to understand this, too. Now, this is the other side of the coin. They signed a, I believe it was a 10-event contract with Saudi Arabia. Which means they are contractually bound to have 10 events in this country. They've, what, done three? I think three. So they've got seven to go. People are going to be pissed about this for a while, but they need to understand one thing. This is a business. This is a business. As WWE fans, we absolutely have the right to say, I don't agree with this. This is wrong. I'm not watching the event. And fine. And I'm sure some people actually stop watching WWE altogether. But you know how big that number is? I could probably count the number of people that actually said that and followed through and have stopped watching wrestling since that happened on one hand. It's more, I don't want to say it's an idle threat, It's more of just trying to feel like you're saying the right thing. In the end, you know you're actually going to still watch WWE. You may not watch that particular event, but if WWE can make sure that you're actually not going to leave them for good, they don't give a damn if you don't watch that particular event. Let me just be straight with you. They don't. Again, I'm not affiliated with WWE in any way, anyway, whatsoever. However, and I'm not speaking for them, I'm speaking for myself, I can say... That if I'm a business at the magnitude of WWE and I have a fan base that is hardcore to the end and you know that there are going to be some fans who don't give a damn and don't give a crap about the fact that they're in Saudi Arabia. They just want to be entertained. They just want to be, hey, put on good matches. I don't care where you are. You know, the fact that you are in a place that I don't morally agree with doesn't mean that I'm going to stop watching your show. That, that I think the majority of fans probably felt that way. But you certainly had your loud, outspoken fans, and social media is just a cesspool of of just hate sometimes, of, yo, hashtag cancel WWE Network, all this stuff. Well, I can tell you, again, this is a business. WWE is a business, and they are not a charity organization, despite what Stephanie McMahon may make you believe on her Instagram and Twitter and on a weekly basis when she was on TV, that this is actually not a charity. They're actually not just affiliated with the, the V Foundation and, and, and the, um, Susan G. Komen and Connor's Cure and Be a Star. Believe it or not, they actually are a for-profit company. I, I know. Sit down. I should have probably warned you before I told you that news. So despite what the, the, the fact that they run from their own identity of being a wrestling company, because that's what they are. They can, they can pretend to be whatever else that they want. They are a wrestling company. That WWE is a business. They're a for-profit company, all joking aside. They are a for-profit organization. What does that mean? They try to make money. They try to make money. And you may say, well, there's, there's morals. There's got to be a limit. 
Well, let me just let me say this. WWE did not commit any of those crimes in Saudi Arabia. WWE did not suppress any of those women in Saudi Arabia. And Saudi Arabia is using WWE as a platform for their own political gains and their propaganda. Let's just be straight. WWE has agreed to run all of these things about what Saudi Arabia has done and the progression that they have made with the women in Saudi Arabia who weren't allowed to drive and now they're allowed to drive, yet they're still not able to compete on the card, which WWE, I'm sure, is working very aggressively to do because why? It would be a great PR move in 2019 to make sure that, my God, WWE is the first ever organization to allow or to be the platform that Saudi Arabia has allowed women to compete on. You know they want that headline. They are salivating at that headline. It is such a 2019 move. But that's fine. They're a company. They want to make sure that they are, they're so soft in the eyes of their, their sponsors. I understand that. They're, they're trying to make money. It's about the money, folks. And if you think that that uh, WWE is going to go back on their contract with Saudi Arabia that's worth tens of millions of dollars, maybe more. I may maybe undershooting that. You guys have another thing coming. You may like it, whatever. You, you guys can like it or hate it or protest the event. The fact is, Crown Jewel's happening. And I understand. I'm not going to protest the event. I'm, I'm not going to be. Look, this is, this is what my, my second job. This is what I love to do. I'm not going to protest an event that's not going to really do anything other than I can say, well, I protested. I didn't watch. Did you watch? Oh, you watched. You you know, you're a dick. Why did you watch? Come on. I'm watching WWE. Again, I may not support where they are, but I love the product. And we all know when they leave Saudi Arabia, you're going to be watching anyway. I don't need to care about where they are. WWE didn't support this. They're not part of a terrorist organization. They are not trying to suppress the women that have been suppressed there for, my God, centuries. They didn't commit these murders. Remember the American journalists that got chopped up, right? And the, you know, the prince was actually found to be a part of the, <laughs> found to be a part of, uh, of the operation. That's bad. But WWE did not support this. They are just there to do what they need to do and put on a show and leave. They're not there for any other reason. So you can protest it, and you can you can sit out, and that's great. I understand people want to protest, and it, it's your right. I mean, it's the I guess the best form of protest that you can have. I you know I've talked to some people on Twitter that are you know they didn't watch Crown Jewel, and I understand why they didn't. But as for me, that's to me that doesn't accomplish anything. It doesn't it doesn't reflect negatively on me. I'm sure some people are thinking the opposite. It does not negatively ref- reflect on me that I want to watch an entertainment organization do what they do best and watch what I love to watch. That's ultimately what it comes down to. Now, if you want to protest the event, cool. You guys do what you want to do. I'm not going to protest any event in Saudi Arabia. I don't agree with the or the government. I think it's awful with the, how they've treated women. Um, and, and, and now that the women are starting to, at least apparently in the eyes of the propaganda video they ran, starting to gain some actual, you know, basic human rights. That's certainly progress. But I don't need to go all 2019 and go hashtag things and say how, you know, I've got great morals and I'm a great person. And look at what I stood up to by not watching, you know, Saudi Arabia and, or watching Crown Jewel. Yeah, it doesn't do anything. At least this is my perspective, guys. And I, look, I respect everybody who doesn't want to watch the event. I understand why you're not watching it. I know why you're not watching it. And it doesn't mean that I'm watching it. And that means, oh, I'm watching it because I support all the bad things. No. No. It's a choice. It's a personal choice. So I just wanted to point that out there while I am going to cover any event that they do in Saudi Arabia. That's what I'm going to do. So... How about that for the uh, end of this show here? And guys, thank you so much for listening. I'll be back on Tuesday with my AEW host. I get to reintroduce you guys to him and cover Monday Night Raw. I'll be back also Wednesday and Thursday with another co-host to discuss everything in this week in WWE as we lead up to next Sunday's Hell in a Cell pay-per-view that is going to be noteworthy that's for damn sure. Again, head on over to patreon.com slash WWE podcast. If you want an ad free listening experience, 
and also to the website. You guys know the deal. And hit me up on Twitter. There's uh, no better way to get a hold of me than on Twitter. You can also email me too at realwwepodcast at gmail.com. And uh, I'll be trying to post a video too on Patreon tomorrow with some talking points that I did not cover tonight. So look for that on the Patreon feed. Until then, I'll talk to you next time.